This is episode six with special guest, Professor Thomas Seyfried. Welcome to My Kid Cures Cancer. My name is Ryan Sternagel, former regular guy turned dad colleagist, cancer coach, and health advocate. Each week we'll talk to a new expert on a particular aspect of beating cancer or human optimization to bring you one step closer on your path to true health. Thanks for spending some time with us today. Now let's dive into this valuable, life-saving information which you're not going to hear about in a mainstream hospital. All right, friends, have you heard about the metabolic theory of cancer but still need some clarification on exactly what it is and what it means for your path to wellness and healing cancer? If so, you are most certainly in the right place as today on the show we have the scientist, professor, and dare I say godfather of the modern day understanding of cancer as a metabolic disease who has revived the simple truth laid out in the middle of the last century. Dr. Thomas Seyfried, PhD, is professor of biology at Boston College in Massachusetts and published a groundbreaking treatise entitled Cancer as a Metabolic Disease on the Origin, Management, and Prevention of Cancer in 2012. The treatise provides extensive information showing that cancer can be best defined as a metabolic mitochondrial disease rather than as a genetic disease. This new concept has implications for the development of new non-toxic cancer therapies, including the ketogenic diet. Experts in the cancer research field have praised the comprehensive study as one of science's hottest topics. Dr. Seyfried has been a featured speaker at numerous scientific symposia and conferences relating to cancer, including the second annual Ancestral Health Symposium, the Educational Session Lecture, American Association of Cancer Research, and this really was incredible to have Professor Seyfried in to talk with us so early on in the show. Our goal for this show and everything we do is to paint a very clear picture in the areas you need to be focusing on in healing cancer to make sure you're covering all of your bases and quite possibly the most important area is the same one that many people have the least understanding of and that is cellular metabolism and the mitochondria's role in cancer. This is not a new theory. It's been around since Nobel Prize winning scientist Otto Warburg proposed it back in the 1920s and even a bit before that as well, but only recently has been has it been revived largely due to the professor's work, and he's the perfect evangelist for it as he has a master's degree and PhD in genetics, so it certainly was something he had to come around to for himself. Professor Seyfried explains how there is no consistency in genetic mutations across cancer types or even much across individual cancers, but the one hallmark trait that all cancer cells share is that they ferment glucose and glutamine to produce energy and why this is so important to our understanding of cancer. He explained how genetic mutations and negative epigenetic changes in gene expression like oncogenes turning on and tumor suppressor genes turning off are not the main drivers of cancer, but really the byproducts of damaged cellular respiration along with defective mitochondria. In the many experiments and studies that have been done over the years to prove this, most importantly, from an implementation perspective, we got into how lowering blood glucose and raising ketones along with other metabolic therapies will kill many cancer cells outright and leave the rest much more vulnerable to target therapies and how one would get started on this approach through fasting and the ketogenic diet. And right along these lines, Dr. Seyfried also explained two terms that every cancer patient and preventer alike need to know autophagy and mitochondrial biogenesis, which are the cleaning out of defective mitochondria and the growth of new healthy mitochondrial populations. Again, this is absolutely foundational stuff that you really need to have a firm grasp on if you're serious about having all of your bases covered in the healing process or preventing for that matter. So grab a notepad or open up the notes app on your phone and get ready to write down some key concepts to follow up on. And with that being said, I'm so glad you stopped by My Kid Cures Cancer, where it is our goal to bring all sides of the discussion on how to heal cancer and be truly healthy to the same table to give you one place to tune into for the most well-rounded perspective possible. This is a show for people going through cancer by people going through cancer, inspired by my wife Teddy and I's experience with childhood cancer bringing our son Ryder from a stage 4 cancer diagnosis to the happy, healthy little boy he is today. If you aren't dealing with a cancer diagnosis and want to keep it that way, this is a show that will be extremely helpful to you as well. We'll get to the interview with Professor Thomas Seyfried in a few minutes, but before we do, just a few things to go over, starting with our favorite disclaimer. 
that the information you hear on this show is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Now, this week's question from our friends comes from Susan on the Facebook page, and it reads, Ryan, I hate to take up your time with a question I know you have already posted about. I just can't find it. I remember you posting about something attached to your iPhone to reduce EMF slash radiation. Are you still happy with this device, or is there a new and improved one on the market? I'm also doing some research, and if I come up with something, I will pass it on. But until then, I was going to follow your lead. Thank you once again for sharing all of your valuable information. All right, Susan, I picked this question because I never miss a chance to get up on a soapbox and preach about EMF as much as I can, that the only sure thing to do when it comes to EMF is no EMF. Obviously, you can't avoid it in the world around you, but when it comes to your home and your belongings, you do have absolute control. We hardwire everything that needs an internet connection in our home using good old-fashioned Ethernet cables and USB adapters when needed. Ryder doesn't play with iPads or anything like that, but if he did, he would certainly be on airplane mode. And when it comes to the phone itself, if I'm ever carrying it around for more than a few seconds, it's on airplane mode. And in the house, it's either on airplane mode or sitting in a windowsill far away from where we're hanging out if I'm expecting a call. Now, with all that being said, we do use blocker cases for our phones and we do use a particular kind of the harmonizer dot things that everyone sticks on all of their electronics and wears on themselves. All the phone cases we've tested with our EMF meter have somewhat of a reduction, but it's nowhere near complete. But we keep testing and returning them and have held on to the one that's been the best so far. On the dot harmonizer things, all I know is that the area still registers the same amount of EMFs with or without the dot for everyone we've tested, which is why I am skeptical of the whole concept of the harmonizing thing is it's not easy to prove. The dots we did get early on and still have, however, do have what appear to be some pretty legit third-party double-blind studies on them using stuff like thermal imaging, live blood cell microscopy, and bioimaging, so I figure if anything has any validity to it, maybe it's these, but again, these are strictly the icing on the airplane mode cake, and only given the it might be better to use them than not status. I'll link to the dots and the phone case we use in the resources mentioned section of the article associated with this episode that you can find on the website at mykidcurescancer.com slash Thomas dash Saferead and Saferead is spelled S-E-Y-F-R-I-E-D. Okay, I have just one announcement for the week and it is without a doubt the most exciting announcement to date. We have our first Rockstar Patreon supporters and you heard me right, that was plural Two incredible people have said, yes, we think the work you're doing is important and we'd like to see more of it by pledging whatever monetary amount they chose per month. And we try to at least show a token of our appreciation when you do this. Ashley Alba has stepped up to the fighter level at $10 per month for which she gets a public acknowledgement on the next podcast. So here it is. Ashley, you are an incredible human being and have chosen to do something very important with your hard-earned money. Thank you so, so much. At that level, Ashley also gets her name emblazoned on the website from now until the end of time and and a day early release of all content whenever possible. As I'm recording this intro at nearly midnight, the night before the podcast is supposed to be released, that will not be happening today, but keep a lookout, Ashley. You will truly be on the cutting edge. Also, at the make a difference level of $1 per month, we had Becky Libel. And Becky, I'm sorry if I didn't get your name right, but since it's the first week, I had to thank both of our awesome supporters. So Becky, You too are truly awesome, and it means so, so much to us that you would choose to acknowledge the work that we're doing here and support us. And just as an example of how this helps, I've been talking about this 10 things you need to know if your child has been diagnosed with cancer document we created for a few weeks now that we literally have not had the money to be able to change the verbiage on the form of our homepage. You enter your email address in to get it, 
It won't be a lot, but after a few years of going through all of this ourselves, we're literally counting every last penny. So now we will literally be taking that money to get someone to change our homepage so we can finally start sending everyone that signs up for this very valuable document we put together, if I do say so myself. If you do want the document right now, you can sign up on the website for another one called The Five Things We Did First. Just sign up for that one and reply to the confirmation and let us know and we will send you the 10 things you need to know if your child has been diagnosed with cancer along with it. Real quick, I want to mention our coaching program. We help anyone seeking better health for any reason in the program, but in particular, if you are a parent of a child who has been diagnosed with cancer, there is a whole nother world of nuances to take into account when implementing an integrative approach that no one that has not been there for themselves can really speak to. And that is where we can truly offer something that very, very few people can, as this has been our life every day, day in and day out since May of 2014. If you want to learn more, you can see the details of the coaching program at mykidcurescancer.com slash connect. As always, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can get it on the go on iTunes. And if you're listening to the podcast, check out the YouTube channel where we post the videos of these interviews, along with a whole lot more of informational goodness that is not on the podcast. And of course, be sure to subscribe on both of those platforms so you never miss a single piece of life-saving content. All right, with that, let's get to the interview with Professor Thomas Seyfried. This discussion was an intellectual stretch and a very simplified view of cancer all at the same time. Get ready to have your understanding of what it means to heal cancer expanded much further than you thought it could go. Professor, thanks, uh, thanks so much for coming on to the show. Well, well, thank you very much, Ryan. It's, uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here to uh, address some of the issues that you are interested in, your followers are interested in. Yeah, well, um, you know, when you're when you're going through cancer, it's 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 about the only thing you're interested in for quite some time. So we're right. we're doing yeah. our best to to try to bring the information to everyone in a way that makes sense that it takes into account all the other all the other things they might be hearing at the same time. So that's that's always the tough part. Yeah. Um, but yeah, let's uh, that that being said, let's dive in. Do you want to? Just maybe tell everybody how you came to start researching cancer and you know how that led you to come to the conclusion that you have that that cancer is a, a metabolic disease rather than a, a, a genetic disease, which is the prevailing theory. Yeah, well, um, it didn't come uh, overnight. It took uh, it took uh, several decades uh, to come because you know I'm my training is all in genetics. So um, I'm, I have a master's degree and a PhD in genetics. So I'm quite familiar with uh, the concept of genetics. Um, but we started off our work on cancer basically in biochemistry, basically looking at lipid metabolism, different, different types of lipids in the tumor cells, uh, to see whether or not we could um, find some sort of a connection. What does it mean and all this kind of stuff? And it started at Yale University when I was there. Um, I had, I had participated in some neurosurgical procedures for glioblastoma, and we were looking at comparing lipid profiles in human glioblastoma with some of the mouse uh, brain cancer models that we developed when I was at Yale. I carried all that stuff with me to Boston College, uh, where we published a number of papers on, on, on different lipid problems and tumors. But it wasn't until uh, we got a drug uh, from a company uh, to, to treat a lipid storage disease. Uh, and we threw the drug on top of some mice that had brain tumors. And it was very interesting to see the tumor shrink from this drug. And we, we thought the drug was causing the shrinkage because of the effect that it had on the lipids, but it turned out it made the animals eat less food. And, um, the tumor shrunk tremendously when the animals ate less food. So we put a control group just give the animals less food and see what happened. And it worked just as well as the drug. <laughs> <laughs> it turned out the drug was working through calorie restriction. And uh, so I said, what is going on here? You know, so my associate joined me at that time, Dr. Perna Mukherjee, and she had shown that calorie restriction, just cutting back the food, could shut down the blood vessels inside these tumors. 
And uh, we said, what? And that was, she was doing it in prostate cancer. So we said, does it work the same way in brain cancer? So calorie restriction turned out to be a powerful therapeutic uh, uh, modality to treat brain tumors. It, it's anti-angiogenic, it's, uh, it stops blood vessels, it, it's anti-inflammatory, uh, it kills the tumor cells by, so we said, how is it killing the tumor cells? And it turns out that it lowers blood sugar. And then, uh, and then I said, why, why is blood sugar so important to these tumor cells? And then you go back and you find Otto Warburg from the 1920s yep. told, every, told everyone that all these tumor cells have defective respiration. And the only way they can survive is to use glucose as a fermentable fuel. And uh, so we said, wow, that's the way calorie restriction is working, is depriving the tumor cells of their fermentable fuel and the tumor cells are dying. So, um, so it turns out that, you know, I read Warburg's papers very carefully and um, we were big into genes. We thought that maybe, maybe it was the mutations, genetic mutations in the mitochondria that was causing the tumor cells to be dependent on glucose. So what we did is we sequenced the genome of all these brain tumor cells, and we couldn't find a single mutation. So it, it couldn't have been the mutations in the, in the mitochondrial genetic material. So I said, well, what's going on? If, if Warburg is right, there must be something else wrong with the mitochondria besides gene, genetic mutations. And that's when we found that one of these key lipids that controls the function of the electron transport chain was defective in every single tumor that we looked at. As a matter of fact, no tumor has ever been found that has a normal amount of this cardiolipin, a lipid on the inner membrane uh, of the uh, mitochondria, which controls oxphos. So this directly supported Otto Warburg's theory that the mitochondria or tumor are defective. For whatever reason, the people in the cancer field don't acknowledge this. They ignore it. I, I don't know if they don't even know what cardiolipin is. So uh, people argue and say, oh, no, tumor cells have normal mitochondria because they take up oxygen and they make ATP. And I, and I said, well, it's not coming from oxfos. It's, got, it's coming from some other fermentation process. And just to interrupt you, when you say oxfos, could you expand on that term for the, for the audience? Yeah, sorry, yeah, of course. We breathe air, like I tell everybody. Everybody knows you, you breathe air. Uh, why we breathe air is because uh, we get energy. Oxygen serves as an acceptor for electrons. We exhale CO2. So this is basically from the foods that we eat. So we generate energy by uh, respiration. We burn fuels just as a fire would burn wood. We capture the energy in the food that we eat in the form of ATP, and we need oxygen to do that. So we breathe in air, and the ox there's oxygen in the air that we breathe, and this f forms the combust allows the combustion of the fuels that we eat. So our bodies are are a, are a combustion machine, and it's based on the breathing of the air that we have. And we're all respiring. You're breathing. I'm breathing. And that keeps our cells alive. The dog is breathing. The mouse is breathing, right? Everything is breathing. Because if you stop their breathing, they die. But the cancer cells are living without oxygen. Even when oxygen is present, the cancer cells continue to generate energy from a fermentation. So fermentation is an ancient pathway that it was present before oxygen came into the environment. So all the organisms that existed in the, uh, in the ancient uh, days uh, were fermenters. They they got energy from fermentation. So the cancer cell is simply doing the same thing. It's getting energy from a very primitive, a non-oxygen non form of energy. And um, so so when we found that these tumor cells have these defects, in, and that's the reason why, because their little organelle inside every cell, the, rest, the mitochondria, is the organelle that allows us to generate energy from oxygen. And if that organelle is damaged, most cells die. Like I told you, like I tell people, you want to know how powerful it is? Hold your breath for about five minutes and see, see what happens. To you. <laughs> you fall over. You're going to turn purple and fall over. That's because your cells can't get the oxygen to generate the energy anymore, right? But the cancer cell can still live. It lives without oxygen. And it's doing the same thing that all the organisms on the planet did before oxygen came in the environment. So... When cancer cells are fermenting, they become extremely resistant to radiation and chemo and all these things. So, so the question everybody says, oh, these tumor cells, they're so tough. They know how to escape. They survive radiation. They survive chemo. 
and they survive all these other things. Well, uh, the question is, they survive because they're still fermenting. It, it, what do they ferment? The question is, what do they use to get energy in the absence of oxygen? And they use glucose and glutamine. The most abundant amino acid is glutamine, and they have plenty of that. And we're constantly uh, surrounded by glucose. So the glucose in our bloodstream and the amino acid glutamine in our tissues and bloodstream are, are keeping these tumor cells alive. So if you want to kill the tumor cells, you have to take away the fuels that are they're using for their growth. And that's glucose and glutamine. And that goes back to what Otto Warburg said. The tumor cells are fermenters. So if you want to get rid of cancer, you have to stop their fermentation. And the easiest way to do that is remove the fuels. And then what you do is you transition the whole body over to ketones, which can only be burned in cells that have good mitochondria. So therefore, the ketones can't be used by the tumor cells because they have bad mitochondria. It's not that complicated. So in fact, it's, it's so embarrassingly simple that some people say it's too simple and therefore it cannot be correct because the system, because what you just said is too simple. And that's the reason why they, they railroaded Otto Warburg out of town because his concepts were simply too simple. And they said, cancer cannot be that simple. And we then launched it as a genetic. So the gene theory of cancer is enormously complicated, massively complicated, so complicated that we have to recruit uh, the IBM computer called Watson to try to help us figure out all these gene mutations. Uh, the problem is nobody told Watson that it's not a genetic disease. So this dumbass computer is down there trying to figure <laughs> out this genetic information for a disease that's not genetic. <laughs> so, so it's <laughs> it's really a tragedy. It's it's really uh, it's really a terrible situation. But this is what people think is important, and they mindlessly uh, chase this uh, gene theory. Now. The, the, the problem is the genes are all, the gene mutations that are loaded in cancer are coming because the, the cells are fermenting, generating reactive oxygen species and producing mutations as a byproduct of the damaged respiration. So it's an effect, it's not the cause. So this whole field of cancer research is chasing effects, not causes. And that's the reason why we have 1,600 people a day dying from cancer, and the rate of death from cancer goes up faster than the number of new cases. So this is a tragedy of monumental proportion driven by a field that's absolutely clueless as the understanding of the biology of the disease. So there's no, there's no mystery here why we have no major advances. So uh, people have, you have to tell the people at the top medical schools what's going on. But, they, but the problem is they, 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 they don't want to know this information. And if they, if they know it, they don't talk about it. So we have a problem. That's the problem right there. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. It's my uh, the the conventional oncologist that we that we go to for for MRIs and such for my son um, is is doing a bit of work on this this sequencing the genome of of tumor cells and trying to come up with uh, you know custom targeted therapies and so on and so forth. Yeah. And, um, but it's funny because you watch the, the, the promo videos for that sort of oh, stuff and they make it seem like it's around the oh, corner and it's, you oh. know, it's going to be here tomorrow, these personalized therapies and whatnot. But, but I actually, I actually like him a lot cause I, I, I asked him about it and he said, well, yeah, you know, those videos are all well and good. But the thing is, is we can't, we find all these mutations, but then we, we, we have no clue which one's the driver. There's, there's, there's no, no indication dri that there's a primary driver. And so he's, he's pretty upfront about it and just says, you know, it's it's a long way out because they they still have no clue what they're looking at in terms of what is actually driving the cancer. It's not, it has nothing to do with the driver. There's no drivers. The 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 it's a complete waste of time and energy and money. Tell them to do something else. The the the, the issue here, but the problem is they're locked into a genetic dog, the dogma. They're locked. They're locked into a mindset, a viewpoint, uh, and, and and it's like a religion. You can't change someone's religion despite the argument that you could say that the other guy's religion is better. It, 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 these people are so uh, dogmatic in the way they view it. So the, the, the nuclear transfer experiments through cold water all over that whole hypothesis, you take the nucleus of the tumor cell and put it into a new cytoplasm, despite the fact that it has all these driver mutations, and they all turn off and the cells grow normally, despite the fact that it's the nucleus of the tumor cell that now becomes regulated. It's the mitochondria that calls the shots, not the nucleus. So, so it's a mitochondrial metabolic disease, and the mutations are downstream epiphenomena, and that's the reason why sequencing genomes and looking at all that stuff is nonsense. It's not going to have any effect on the, on the, and it hasn't. We've been doing that now for 25 years, and the number, we have 1,600 people a day dying from cancer. 
it, it's getting worse and worse. And uh, the gene theory is is part of the problem, not the solution. Let me ask you this. So I, I've, I'm really big on, you know, trying to find the, the primary upstream driver and all that. And obviously, you know, um, the, the, the conventional view of just you were you inherited your genes and, and that's just the way it is. And maybe you got a mutation along the way. And, and that's, you know, that's what's it, it doesn't make a lot of sense when you when you think about the rates going up higher and higher and higher every year like they like they are. But then, um, you know, in, in the in the context of researching the, you know, whatever you want to call it, natural or holistic or alternative viewpoints on cancer, you, you come across, um, you know, your, the, the metabolic theory. But then you also come across um, just the, the concept of epigenetics, you know, the 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 thought that, yes, you do inherit a certain set of genes, but, um, you know. <laughs> some genes might be expressed and some genes might not some might turn on and some might turn off given your given your you know, your environment and your lifestyle and so on and so forth and and I know that in a lot of alternative circles even is is used to explain what causes cancer that you you get enough oncogenes turning on and enough tumor suppressor genes turning off and uh and and that's how you know the cells lead to to go out of control and, and, and not die when they should and that sort of thing. Um, so I, I, I guess I'm just curious what all, you know, what experiments you've done. Uh, obviously, the nuclear well, transfer is huge, just but say, just in light of what I just said, yeah. Yeah, well, let me just say, you know, you have nuclear epigenetics and extra nuclear epigenetics. And what most of the people in the field are looking at is nuclear epigenetics, okay? And when people start talking, they like to use the term epigenetics uh, as a, it's all smoke and mirrors. So, uh, oh, wow, look at this, look at that. Um, you know, it, it's, it, the mitochondria is an, is an extra nuclear epigenetic system. So when you, and, and this, this is, again, it's, it's, it's the fail, it's, it's the clinging to the gene theory, whether it's an epigenetic explanation or a nuclear uh, mutation explanation. It's a cling on to the gene. Th it's not a genetic disease. You can take the nucleus that has all the, the methylations, the acetylations and the phosphorylations, which is so-called the nuclear epigenetic system and put that nucleus into a new cytoplasm and the oncogenes turn off. All right. They turn off because, because you have normal respiration. Now you don't need to drive a fermentation metabolism. The oncogenes are drivers of a fermentation metabolism. So if you don't need to ferment, the oncogenes don't need to be on. And that was shown by Benny Carapato at Baylor College of Medicine. So the whole, the whole expression of these genes is due to the fact that the cells need to ferment. So, so we know that I know that, and some other people know that. So the bottom line, what do we want to do? Do we want to study complicated epigenetics while 1600 people a day are dying from cancer? Or do you want to stop the disease? So it's so simple. Just take away the fuels that are driving the fermentation and the tumor cells die. It's not that complicated. What are they eating to survive? They're using glucose and glutamine. How many studies, clinical trials are being done today to target glucose and glutamine? And the answer is none. All right. 1600 people a day are dying because no one's targeting glucose and glutamine. So if you want to stop the disease, you do that. People say it can't be that simple. And I'm saying, yes, it is. And if you want to, and, and if you want to see the results, I'll show you the results. And people and animals that are targeted near, targeting their glucose and glutamine, the tumors resolve. All right. And we use, 2D, we use hyperbaric oxygen when people are in, in therapeutic ketosis. And that blows that. So you, chemo and radiation kill tumor cells by creating oxid, oxidative stress. The tumor cells are resistant to oxidative stress because they're fermenting. So if you take away their fermentable fuels, they become, they become vulnerable to oxidative stress. So hyperbaric oxygen will create oxidative stress once you remove the fermentation antioxidant system. So we can, use, we can substitute radiation for hyperbaric oxygen a hell of a lot uh, less toxic, uh, and it will do the job. So, so we, we can substitute all these toxic drugs and toxic procedures, surgical, you know, surgical mutilation of tissues. You know, we can substitute all of that 
for a strategy that targets the fuels that these tumor cells are using. We don't have to get into a big discussion of epigenetics and all this kinds of stuff that make it look so complicated. It's not that complicated. Do you want it to be complicated? Then let's focus on epigenetics while 1,600 people a day continue to die. It, it, it's, just, it's just like, it, it's, it, it makes no sense to me. So uh, the reason that the hyperbaric works so much better when you know you're in a state of ketosis is it is it I mean in a layman's term is it because the the cancer cells are kind of desperate for fuel and they're opening up so to speak and uh, something on that nature and that's uh, that's why it it has such a bang when it does. Yeah. Well, first of all, you have to say, okay, tumor cells already produce a lot of reactive oxygen species. So these reactive oxygen species are, are radicals that, that should kill the cell. Because when you irradiate the, the tissue, you are creating reactive oxygen species that blow apart the tumor cells, but also damage the normal cells as well. So, so why are the tumor cells resistant to radiation in many cases? Not all cases, obviously. You know, some people can be cured by radiation. The problem is your body now has been subjected to a very powerful carcinogen that sometimes in the future could come back at you in, 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 in some way. So the question is, well, we got these tumor cells. They're already making a lot of reactive oxygen species, but they're not dying. Why are they not dying? Because their antioxidant system is so powerful. And, the, and, the, and what does that mean? Well, their glutathione and their catalase, these, these are enzyme systems that, that reduce the damage from reactive oxygen species. The tumor cells have very high antioxidant capability. What is responsible for their high antioxidant capability? So if we remove their antioxidant capability and increase reactive oxygen species, they should die. And what's, what's, what, what's, they have a shield, and that shield is, is based on glucose and glutamine. These two fuels are responsible for the powerful antioxidant shield in those tumor cells. So by reducing glucose and glutamine you, and put the patient into the hyperbaric oxygen, you essentially remove the shield and explode the tumor cells, the same way radiation and chemo would do, but without the toxicity, the normal cells burn the ketones that protects them against reactive oxygen species, but the tumor cells can't use the ketones, so they're not protected by the ketones. So it's a beautiful, elegant, simple system to destroy cancer without harming the normal cells of the body. And I don't know if we if we laid the groundwork for that or not for for folks. Can you could you just explain briefly what ketones are and and how they're generated and why they're generated that that sort of thing? Well, ketones. I mean, we evolved. Uh, uh, the human being evolved as a, a, a to starve. You know, our existence on the planet was uh, almost terminated on many many events of, ex of extinction. But we survive because we can go long periods of time without food. And uh, what we do is we, we, we uh, use fat. We, 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 st we have fat storage, and that fat is then converted into water-soluble ketone bodies. So we have we, our fat, the fat comes out of fat cells. It goes to the liver. Our liver, it's like, as I said, it's like a wood chipper. It takes these long chains of fatty acids, just like a log, and chops them up into these smaller little water-soluble ketone bodies. And the ketone bodies are an alternative fuel to glucose. Uh, our brain burns primarily glucose, but we can burn ketone bodies. The heart will burn ketone bodies. In other words, we can transition our body over to a non-glucose source of energy. So this is a evolutionarily conserved adaptation because if we were to use our protein for energy, we would starve to death in about a week if we burned up our muscles in our body and we couldn't run, we couldn't chase animals. We, we, we would be dead in about a week or two using protein, but we use these fats. So fats uh, have a tremendous amount of energy, but that energy is, is stored in these ketone, that broke it up the ketone bodies. But you have to have a very good mitochondrial system in the cells to burn ketone bodies. So when you burn ketone, it's like a super fuel you get more energy from a ketone than you do from a molecule of, of glucose. So it's a super energy fuel and also prevents the development of, re of reactive oxygen species in normal cells. So it's a beautiful, clean burning fuel, but you have to have a really good mitochondrial system 
to burn the ketone. And the tumor cells are, have a, a destructed mitochondria. There's few of them. They can't use the ketone as energy. So, so the normal cells get healthy and the tumor cells get, get uh, vulnerable, especially when you take away their fermentable fuels. So it's a transition. You lower the blood sugar and you elevate the ketones and that puts tremendous metabolic stress on the tumor cells while enhancing the health and vitality of the normal cells. As I said, it's an elegant, simple system. Yeah, so it's essentially a, a capability that you know we we've had for for thousands, if not millions, of years. That uh, you know is just part of part of being a human. But um, you know, I, I hear a lot of people talk about these days with all the availability of you know all, all the carbs, really. Just, yeah, yeah. And and twenty four seven eating. You you wake up, you start eating, you you eat until you go to bed. We've essentially lost that capability to uh, to transition well, over to ketones. Oh, you're absolutely right, but 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 we can do it because there's a remembrance, because every cell in our body earned the right to be in this body. This body uh, suffered enormous uh, stress throughout evolutionary history, so so we are supremely capable of 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 uh, entering into these uh, states where food is not available to us, um, and that requires uh, an integrated genome. So. Uh, you know, the, the genomes in our cells can um, can uh, adapt to energy stress. But the tumor cell has all these broken chromosomes, point mutations, uh, you know, d d gene mutations. Everything is, is like damaged. So when you begin to transition the body away from uh, the abundance of carbohydrates and try to use these ketones, these tumor cells cannot adapt. So they're, 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 they lost their flexibility. So this whole concept that tumor cells are tough and resistant, they're only, they only give that appearance because they're be, as long as they have their fermentable fuels, they're resistant to everything. If you take away their fermentable fuels, they become extremely vulnerable uh, to these kinds. Who's doing this in the clinics? Nobody is doing this in the clinics. 1,600 people a day are dying because people don't understand the biology of the disease. So they continue to irradiate and poison these poor people. Uh, and then when you take the drugs that make these poor individuals so sick, oh, he stopped eating. Well, he's being poisoned. So to increase his appetite, we're going to give him high dose steroids. This will make him hungry. So he'll eat these carbohydrates and the steroids elevate the sugar in the blood and the damn tumor cells survive on this. So the very, it's like you would, ne if you understood the biology of cancer, you would never do this to anybody. I mean, this is a this is a tragedy of monumental proportions. So it, we're 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 treating a disease by people that don't understand the biology of the disease, and consequently, the results are clear in the death statistics. So we could drop the death rate of cancer by fifty percent in about five years if they if they understood cancer as a mitochondrial metabolic disease. I have no doubt about it, but nobody is doing this. And no matter, I could talk people blue in the face and they just don't, either they don't understand, they don't want to understand, it, it, it's not compatible with the model system that they're using. You get every kind of an ex, where are the clinical trials? If I, I would believe you if I had a clinical trial. Well, who's going to do the clinical trial? You're going to pay for the clinical trial? Who, what pharmaceutical company is going to step up and do all what I'm saying? You know, it, it's just like, so you have, the consequences are no major advance in cancer, period. I mean, it's just that simple. Yeah. Yep. Um, and when we talk about uh, people going back onto, you know, being able the the capability of, of burning ketones in, instead of instead of glucose, uh, I know you talk a lot about fasting. Is that is that a, a mechanism to to help people make well, that transition? Yeah, I think uh, fasting brings your body into a into a state where where therapeutic ketosis becomes very easy. So, uh, you know, going on a 24, 48 hour water only fast brings your body into a state. Usually it takes 36 hours to burn up your glycogen reserves. The available sugar in the body goes out in, in about eight, eight or eight or 10 hours. But then you start burning your glycogen, which is in the liver and the muscles. And that takes another several. So you're about 36 hours. Your body is realizing, hey, this guy's not eating. We're going to die if this if we don't start mobilizing the fats. And it usually takes about 48 hours to get your 48 hours, 72 hours to get into a good uh, therapeutic ketotic state. And then you transition over to ketones. Now, I, I want to emphasize that fasting and ketogenic diets alone 
are not likely to, to uh, resolve uh, all forms of cancer. It'll slow it down significantly, kill many, many cancer cells, but those that use glutamine will hang on. So you, you've got to be able to target both glucose and glutamine simultaneously to get uh, full resolution of the disease. And again, no one's doing that. So uh, um, of course, they're looking for glutamine inhibitors. A lot of the drugs aren't, aren't working. Some of the older drugs um, work really, really well. And uh, as I told you, uh, reducing the toxicity from these, for these drugs is a lot easier than trying to develop some new. The, the idea is that if you develop a new glutamine inhibitor, you can stand to make tremendous amounts of money. Uh, uh, but if you use the old ones, they work really well. You just have to know how to use them. Um, but the, go the goal is, do you want to make money or do you want to save lives? And uh, my view is, I think, saving lives first. Why don't we, why don't we cut the, the, uh, the death rate by 50 percent? And then we can kind of work out some ideas about some of the other drugs that might might step in. But why should we allow all these poor people to be slaughtered by a disease that we that they don't have to be dying from uh, in, in the numbers that that we have today? There, there's ways to do this. You know, so my view is let's keep people alive and we'll keep them alive for, for a much longer period of time and a higher quality of life while we figure out, you know, are there better drugs that we can use from the ones we're using right now? Um, but why don't we use the ones right now and save all these lives? And and we're not doing that. When we talk about um, you know drugs that that could potentially go after uh, you know lowering blood glucose or diverting blood glucose and also glutamine, I have come across a couple uh, you know natural products that kind of market themselves on the this you know as far as this view. I was curious if you had any experience with them. Um, have you uh, have you come across Avamar or the the new product is is Metatrol, and the yeah. um, you know the the theory being that it I think that diverts glucose away from cancer cells to uh, to healthy cells. Have you, have you looked into that much at all? Um, no, but the, I mean even if you did that, you still have to deal with the glutamine issue. So uh, um, you know getting getting rid of the two, glucose in the body and forcing the body to go into ketones is step number one. Yeah that's the first step. And that's easily, that's very achievable. And so, and let me tell you something, I haven't tested the drug you're talking about because I don't, I don't make any statements unless I've tested it in my preclinical systems because we've developed the best preclinical models of cancer here at Boston college that replicate the exact conditions that uh, occur in, in, in cancers in humans and dogs and other animals. So what works in our systems usually works really well in dogs and humans. Um, so I, the problem is we have so many beautiful drugs and systems that we need to, we need to test, but this costs funds and money. We don't, you know, if we had more money, we'd be able to test a lot of these things. Yeah. But, um, the goal here is yes, push the blood sugars levels down as, as low as you possibly can go, raise those ketones up. So you don't suffer hypoglycemia because, you know, hypoglycemia, a lot of physicians get all freaked out. Oh, are you going to go into unconscious? No, no, no. If your brain is burning ketones, you're not going to go unconscious. So you can push blood sugars down to really, really low levels. My friend Dominic D'Agostino, who, who specializes in this, you know, got his blood sugar down to 25 milligrams per deciliter. Well, he should have been dead, uh, you know, but he's not. And he was walking around. He was very spiritual. He had a, a new insight on life, burning all these ketones. So, um, so you can really force blood sugars way, way down. And then uh, the body goes into this uh, key therapeutic ketosis. The tumor cells are struggling. Uh, many of them are dying. And then you just hammer them with the, the glutamine inhibitor and you, and you wipe them out. You get a slaughter of these tumor cells. They just can't, they can't adapt to these kinds of new metabolic states. And uh, we can do it without harming the patients uh, or the animals. And, and this is what's really exciting. And I, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right, Ryan. There's so many other drugs that can achieve similar kinds of outcomes when, when applied in the, in the strategic, we call it a press pulse. And it's a, it's a strategy of, of dosing, timing, and scheduling for using these different drugs under different conditions. Uh, and, 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 and it works so well. Um, it, it, but people, so many in the oncology field are, don't have any idea about this. They, they don't even know about it. They don't understand the concepts. They're all locked into finding some, some uh, gene-based therapy that doesn't work. So, uh, um, and that's unfortunate. That's the unfortunate situation we're in today. Well, yeah, I, I, you know, it's yeah. going to take a lot more podcasts, and 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 ultimately, you know, it's it's going to be driven by patients and uh, you know caregivers looking for 
demanding another solution. Um, but you know, speaking of uh, clinical settings and implementation, you you have had. I met a, a Dr. Slocum in, uh, and he's he's out of Turkey, and I believe he's following basically your your press pulse theory and, and your protocols. It's, he's he's having some pretty good results over there, isn't he? And, and you were telling me about another guy in in Egypt as well. Yeah. Well, you see, the thing of it is, in in some of these other countries, um, they're they're not yoked. Uh, or restricted as much as some of the oncologists that we have in this country. If you deviate at all from the so-called standard of care as dictated by the American Medical Association, you know, you could lose your license. So a lot of, a lot of uh, physicians fear uh, doing anything outside uh, what's recommended by, uh, on the standards of care. Uh, some of these other countries, they're a little bit you know, less rigid. And if you think you have some logical reason uh, to suggest something that may deviate a little bit from the rigid standard of care, uh, you, you know, as long as you're following the general protocol, um, there's a little bit uh, more flexibility, and I, and I think that you're you're beginning to see outcomes that are 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 really rather spectacular by modifying standards of care, and eventually you'll dump the standard of care when you realize that you have some other ways. The bottom line is people want to live. People want to live, right? They don't want to be poisoned and irradiated. I mean, it, it, the, the issue here is that can you can you achieve the same level of management that the standards of care are delivering without all the toxicity? And I think if people knew that they could do this, they would stampede to come to this because they don't want to be treated. They fear these treatments. When they're told they have cancer, they're devastated by the idea. Now I have to be exposed to these toxic drugs and radiation and surgical mutilation. I mean, you, well, is there another way? Can you can you keep me alive doing something else? And the answer is absolutely. Well, how come nobody is telling me about this? <laughs> That's the, you know, why why don't why didn't my physician? And it's not their fault. They're never trained to do that. They they never heard about it. So their training is in a totally different area. They're not trained to do metabolic therapy. They're trained to do standard of care. And the standard of care is not working for the majority of cancer patients. And then people tell me, oh, yes, I, there's millions of cancer survivors out there. And I said, yeah, but, they, but, they, but their body has been, has, been, has been exposed to toxins and radiation. And I said, that comes back at you. Uh, yeah. you know, it, it can come back at you in many different ways, you know, and there's a new branch of medicine now it's called cancer survivor medicine. It's opening up here at Dana Farber. All these, these survivors have depression, cardiovascular disease, cardio, uh, digestive issues, uh, all these different kinds of things that they have because they survived the standard of care. And that's ridiculous. You shouldn't have to have all that. You shouldn't have to be depressed. You shouldn't have to have cardiovascular problems. You, you shouldn't have to have all this stuff. Why? Why are they having these problems? Because you've been poisoned and irradiated. I mean, if you took normal people and did that to them, they'd have all these problems too. <laughs> Much less a cancer patient. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how, how in your view does the uh, does the mitochondria become damaged in the first place? All right. Well, that's called the oncogenic paradox, which has been the stumbling block for the f entire field for decades. Uh, it was first pointed out by Albert St. Georgi, who received the Nobel Prize for his work on vitamin C. But if uh, I would sec suggest everybody read um, Sid Mukherjee's book, The Emperor of All Maladies. I think that was a New York Times bestseller. Um, it, it was a Pulitzer Prize. And he struggled uh, with the oncogenic paradox. So the, the answer to your question is how do the, nobody can figure out how is it possible that all these people get cancer uh, from different things, like carcinogens in the environment, uh, viral infections? We know hepatitis C, papillomaviruses can cause cancer. You know, you're exposed to all these different PCBs and all these different kinds of things that can cause cancer. Radiation causes cancer. Everybody knows, you know, if you get radiated, oh, everybody fears radiation. Unless you're a cancer patient, they sit you down and then they irradiate you. You know, it's like uh, hypoxia, inflammation. Uh, rare inherited mutations like the re relief from many disease and BRCA1 mutations. Um, age, oh, you get older, you, uh, cancer risk is old. So how do all these very different ways cause cancer? 
And if you look like I have showed in my papers, all of these different provocative agents damage the respiration in a population of cells in a certain tissue that leads to the onset of the disease. Cancer is caused by damage to the respiratory capacity in cells by any one of these provocative agents in the, in the environment. So the link to all forms of cancer come from damage to the radiation, uh, to the respiration, damage to the respiration in a population of cells, leading then to the nuclear mutations, which are downstream epiphenomena. Oncogenes turn on because the cells need to ferment, and the oncogenes are simply uh, transcription factors that upregulate fermentation. So if you fix the mitochondria, the oncogenes turn off. So the oncogenes are a knee-jerk reaction, metabolic knee-jerk reaction to the damage to the respiration. So everybody focuses on downstream effects. And then the cells are fermenting, so you just take away their fermentable fuels and they die. This is not a very complicated system. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's even a lot of the same stuff that you hear, uh, you know, discussed in alternative circles. Maybe, you know, a lot of times it's in the context of, of epigenetics or something like that. But it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's it's either something out of the environment or, or maybe even a, a mold or a virus, something like that. But the, the, the thing they all have in common, you're saying, is that they did damage to the mitochondria and, and block the respiration. And that's, you know, um, yeah. so really... really yeah. So only cells that can ferment are going to become cancer cells. So you have certain cells in the body like neurons. Um, now, neurons in the brain, not not neuroblastoma. Neuroblastoma is a very powerfully fermentable cell. OK, so there's a there's a difference because that's in the uh, above the kidney. But inside the brain, uh, rarely do you get uh, cancer from any neuron. You get cancer from glial cells because glial cells can ferment. Cardiomyocytes, they don't ferment. So the car you get rarely get uh, cancer in muscles or cardiac, but you can only get cancer in those cells that have the capacity to ferment when their respiration is damaged. So if a cell can't turn to fermentation, it can never be a tumor cell. So this is why you don't get cancer in certain cells of the body and cancer cells can come out very vigorously in other cells because they switch to fermentation. If they can't switch to fermentation, they're going to die and they can never become a cancer cell. And that's another thing I was going to ask you about. So it, it, in your view, is this a, is this a hard and fast, um, every single type of cancer that everyone ever gets is, uh, is is fermenting and it's and it's due to mitochondrial damage or are there any you know I, sometimes a lot of times blood cancers will kind of buck a lot of the rules that that you would you would you know think of in a in a normal solid tumor but uh but is it is it pretty hard and fast hallmark in in your view oh absolutely it's the origin of all the cancers there it's one disease so even the blood ca even the blood cancers leukemias they're fermenting like crazy they're blowing out lactic acid so the solid tumors are blown out lactic acid or succinic acid, which is an indication that they're fermenting uh, amino acids. So they're either fermenting glucose or they're fermenting the results of an amino acid. So they're all the same. And this is one of the great problems. Uh, everybody thinks cancer is a hundred different diseases. It's nonsense. It's all the same disease. It just happens in different cells of the body. So when you do a genetic analysis, you say, oh, look at the mutations in this cell, that cell. They're all different from each other. Of course, one is a liver cell and one is a brain cell. Of course, they're going to have different genetic profiles, but they're all fermenting. Whether it's a liver cell or a brain cell, they're fermenting. This is the, this is the scary concept of cancer. It's an incredibly simplistic disease that can be managed with incredibly simplistic <laughs> therapies. And this is such an antithesis to, 20, to, to several decades of research to say this is such a complicated disease. They're all fermenting. What are they fermenting? Glucose and glutamine. What happens when you take away glucose and glutamine? They die. Uh, who's doing this? Why are they? No one is doing this. <laughs> it's an embarrassment. Once we realize uh, what's going on, as I said, in this period from the 1900s to today, will go down as the greatest, the, the greatest fiasco in the history of medicine. There's no other, no other disease, no other situation that will be recognized as such a boondoggle as, as this cancer thing. When, it's, uh, when it can be managed without toxicity, when you can go after the fermentable fuels, and we're not doing that because we think it's something other than what it is, and that's the gene theory. So as long as you think cancer is a genetic disease, the body count will pile up. And you're not going to see the kind of resolution that you should have. So, assuming assuming a, a, a cancer patient takes out what's the word I'm looking for, if they remove you know whatever from their environment, 
was was the cause of that damage in the first place. And that's you know what a lot of people uh, harp on for good reason is is get rid of whatever caused it. Have you have you seen much research? Is there a way to to heal the mitochondria, for lack of a better term? I mean, we're we're talking pretty exclusively so far about about targeting the the fuel source and and just killing the cancer cell. But have have you seen anyone working on anything to do with? Uh, with yeah, with it's healing, reversing that, reversing that uh, process within the cancer cell, and and having it you know revert back to a healthy cell, that sort of thing. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That well, that I, in chapter nineteen of my book, that where now you're now you're going into a different uh, realm. We'd call that prevention. All right. So prevention is a very different strategy. Well, not very different, but it's 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 uh, how do you prevent cancer uh, rather than okay, I got cancer. How are you gonna how are you gonna get rid of it? All right. That's one thing. Is I I ha- you have the disease. How are you going to manage it? The other is, okay, I don't have cancer. How can I prevent myself from ever getting cancer? And the answer is, if, if all cancers arise from damage to the respiration, how do I protect my, my respiratory system from, from the damage that will ultimately cause the cancer? So that means you have to keep your mitochondria healthy. How do you, uh, you, in other words, you need mitochondrial biogenesis, and the mitochondria must be kept, kept healthy. So, and again, it comes right back to therapeutic fasting and ketones. So again, uh, people stop eating, they go on these, in fact, a lot of religions, interestingly enough, always have some aspect of fasting, right? Yeah. It's always like, oh my God, whether you do Ramadan or whether you do Lent or whatever you do, it's like some, some, you have not supposed to eat. What are you going to give up for Lent? I don't know. Give up food, right? So, uh, <laughs> nobody, <laughs> you get super healthy, you, you know, it's, there's a lot of interesting things. So your mitochondria get super healthy. And as a matter of fact, we have this concept called autophagy, which is self-eating. The cells gobble up these inefficient um, organelles like mitochondria. If you have a mitochondria that's not completely functional and you stop eating, that mitochondria gets uh, infused with a lysosome and it's digested for the good of the cell. So we're cleaning house. We're cleaning all these efficient, inefficient organelles when you stop eating because the body is hungry and you got you have organelles that are not carrying their weight. So they're consumed and their molecules are redistributed to those cells that have healthy mitochondria. So it's a beautiful house cleaning system. And and what happens is, is that any mitochondria that might be partially damaged, maybe on its way to a, a potential pre neoplastic state is expo- you, you just you just eliminate that. Um, and you take, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are doing therapeutic fasting and trying to get into therapeutic ketosis. All of this is very anti-cancer. So you're going to keep your body healthy. But, you know, a lot of people don't do that. A lot of people are, you know, we have obesity epidemic in this country. We have a lot of different things that put people at risk for developing cancer. And uh, so it's a whole mindset difference. You know, we we published a paper on the glucose ketone index calculator open access so everybody can see it. And if you lower your blood sugar and elevate your ketones, your mitochondria respiration get very, very healthy. We did it for the cancer patients, basically to help them see if they're in a zone of therapeutic efficacy. But now it turns out that you get all these health gurus and all these guys that are running around wanting to get their body in in ketosis. They're using our glucose ketone index, people who don't have cancer, just to see how healthy they can become. How low, how low they can get their blood sugar and how high they can get their ketones so they can brag to their friends, hey, look at look what I've been able to do. Look how healthy I am. Yeah. So these guys aren't going to get cancer, I can tell you that much. Yeah. yeah. So Yeah, getting the uh what are they getting those the Dexcoms, the the continuously monitoring uh oh, yeah. glucose devices. Yeah. Oh yeah. And and you and you and you get your it's not only glucose, it's just, you get healthy when your ketones are elevated. Yeah. So yeah. um, this is not ketoacidosis, which the type one diabetics have, but uh, for just healthy people, they want to, they go, they, they pride themselves in seeing what kind of a, a ratio they can get. If it's 1.0 or below, some of these guys email me all the time. He says, look at, I got a, I got a 0.3. And I go, oh my God, this guy says, he's really intense. Well, he's not going to get cancer. <laughs> and if he has cancer, he's going to be slaughtering the tumor cells. So, <laughs> yeah, no, the, uh, the, the minute that I can afford that kind of supply at test strips, it's, it's something yeah, that I'd yeah. love to love to mess around with myself, but, uh, 
Yeah, well, that's another thing. Yeah, the, the ketone strips are expensive. The glucose strips are, are not that's, expensive. That's true. Yeah, though they're a lot less expensive. So, yeah. so you brought up autophagy in the uh, autophagy, excuse me, in the uh, you know in the context of, of prevention. But I mean, what about somebody that that has cancer right now? Is is you know that mechanism of of cleaning out uh, a defective mitochondria? Is that is that something they should be well, trying to look at as well? Well, you know, people ask me this is, you know, a, a tumor is a hodgepodge of all different kinds of cells. Um, they're all in different states of fermentation. So some some of the mitochondria and some tumors are struggling to stay functional, whereas in other cells, they're completely blown out. So you have you have this uh, range of cells in a, in a tumor. Uh, it's obviously some of those cells can be, in fact, recovered. Uh, and they can rejoin the society of cells if you can recover their their respiratory capacity. Other cells are beyond recovery. They've passed the threshold where they where they they have too many nuclear gene mutations to recover a normal mitochondrial function. So they're fermenting like crazy. So these guys just have to be uh, eliminated. And, and we just uh, we just target them by by taking away their fermentable fuels, and those that can be restructured and reconfigured can rejoin the society of cells. So there's a parceling. Uh, you slaughter the ones that can't be what can't be reeducated, and you and you enhance the ability of those that can. It's a very simple system. It's not that complicated. Yeah, yeah, and that's I, I suppose the the same basic answer there would would apply to mitochondrial biogenesis as well, to, uh, to yeah. creating new healthy mitochondria. Yes, yes, absolutely, and therapeutic fasting, water only. If you do that for like six or seven days, which is a real struggle. I mean, how many people? Hey, I want to I want to get new bio. Oh yeah, what do you have to do? Stop eating for seven days? I think I'll I think I'll pass on that. <laughs> you know, it's just it's not easy. Are you kidding me? You know, but who wants to do this? You know, and, and, and you got to you got to only do it occasionally. You can't be doing it all the time. You know, we have people out there that have become addicted to fasting. It's like, what the hell? They turn into anorectics and all this kind of, <laughs> thing. you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, there's always some guy that takes it to the extreme. Yeah. So rather than just visiting, the, I always say visit the zone, but don't live in the zone. Oh yeah, I heard you uh, recently on on Dr. Pompa's show. I, I I listened to a lot of his podcasts, and I, I like I like his approach to it. He's got his little five one one rule. He does five days of intermittent fasting, having a very yeah. short time window of eating. One right. day of like a twenty four hour dinner to dinner, right. and then and then one day of maybe like more carbs and and yeah. uh, just to to keep it keep everything in flux and not right. not let your body get too used to anything. But oh no, that is right. There's a lot of there's a lot of ways and variations to do this, you know. So which makes it kind of fun, you yeah. know, or it makes it flexible enough for almost everybody's lifestyle. But you know, if they know about it, you have to have somebody tell you about yeah. this. And, 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 and you have to have a, the, the, the glucose ketone index gives you the hard physiological evidence to support what you're doing. So people say, oh, I'm in ketosis. How do you know? Well, I pee on the strip and it turns, it turns purple. I, I must be in ketosis. But, you know, the problem is the strips don't tell you what's in the blood. If you have any carbohydrate, you pee out the ketones as fast as you make them. So you really have to have the blood monitor to tell you that I'm in a physiological state of therapeutic ketosis. And then, then you can uh, link that to the way you feel, you know, the energized state. You can you can start putting all this together. It's actually it's actually quite interesting. Do you have um, do you have a range of uh, you know measurements of ketones and measurements of glucose that you you know try to shoot for in a in a cancer patient? Well, as I published in the paper, we did some validation studies for brain cancer, but we think it could be validated for, for all the different cancers, except that it hasn't been done yet. So yeah. like for liver cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer. Um, generally, if you can, if it's 1.0 or below, which means that the uh, millimolar, the concentration of metabolic fuels in the blood is that glucose and ketones are essentially the same. Um, uh, right. Most people would have very, very low ketones and very, very high blood sugar, not, uh, not blood sugar in the sense of diabetic. Like if, if, if we're, if we're at, um, 90 milligrams per deciliter of, of glucose, um, and your ketones are, well, you have to convert the dick. You have, that's why the glucose index calculator that we published puts everything on the same platform, all millimolar. So if you're about 4.5 millimolar glucose, and 0.2 millimolar ketone, 
your your ratio is 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 really high like you're up at 40 or 50 like uh but you if you stop eating or you go on uh take ketogenic diets blood sugar gradually starts coming down and ketones start coming up so you get a more uni uh, a, 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 a unity so you get a one to one ratio and if you really go strong on it the ketones then start becoming more com more concentrated in the blood than does the sugar and then you go below one and in that zone the tumor cells are being starved of their glucose and uh, they can't they're choking to death on these ketones so they can't use the ketones but uh, and so it's and the normal cells are getting healthier and healthier from these ketones and the tumor cells are getting un, more and more compromised so it's a beautiful non-toxic way to eliminate the cells and the ones that say the ones that start shifting to glutamine because hey you're taking the glucose is being starved so they open the transporters for glutamine to keep the cells alive. So you just give them a drug to shut down the glutamine and these tumor cells are screwed. They, 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 they just die. They, they can't handle it. So um, it works so beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> Again, who's doing this? No one. <laughs> yeah. That, that's why the patients are all dying or getting, they're getting compromised because they're not using the correct way to deal with the disease. It's so simple, yet no one's doing it. And, and that's the tragedy. People say, well, if you're right, how come nobody's doing this? I said, you tell me. <laughs> I published all this stuff. I mean, people with, with, uh, who can read and write should be able to understand this. What was I going to ask? Oh, so so it's really it's a, it's about the it's about the ratio of, yeah. of ketones yeah. to blood sugar. Um, do I remember it correctly when when you said the, the the milligrams measurement on sugar? If if you basically just divide the blood sugar the standard blood sugar measurement by ten, are you are you then getting oh, 18. into eighteen? Eighteen. Okay. Divide it by eighteen. Divide milligram per deciliter by eighteen, and you get millimolar. So uh, now you can you you can hand calculate that based on the on the meter, um, or you can use the glucose ketone index calculator, which you just put the numbers in there. Boom. Yeah. You get the number right away. So, um, and that makes it easier for patients who don't, for people who don't want to sit down and do the division, <laughs> just push the button, you know, it's not, it's not terribly complicated, but you see, you get all these people that, oh, I don't want to do the division. I, you know, what does this mean? What does that mean? They, all they want to do is push the button, get the number, you know, and that's what we did. Yeah. And so it's another ridiculously simple thing, Sounds but, easy. uh, yeah, very simple, you know, um, and, and, and once you understand what you're doing now, there's a company called heads up health. Uh, that set up an app for for cancer patients and normal healthy patients using the glucose index calculator, well, how much food they're eating, what they're eating, they match their diets, the calories intakes, their glucose index ratios. And now these people have complete, it's like a they have complete charge of their physiology. They're taking charge of their own health and, and they're monitoring all the things they're eating. And some people can eat one thing with another person has to eat another thing. So it's not everybody's the same, uh, you know, burning machine. And, and, uh, they asked me, can I eat this? Can I eat that? I said, well, I don't know. What does it do into your ratio? <laughs> oh, it's just so simple. Just what does it do to your ratio? Yeah. Yeah. That's heads up health. That's, um, you know, there, there's not a whole lot of things that I, I haven't heard about these days in terms of, uh, things cancer patients are using, but that's, that's something I haven't heard about. I'm going to have to it's check a brand that new, out. He just started the company not long ago. Um, and he's putting an app, he's putting an app together and what it does is allows the cancer patient to monitor all the things they're eating, all the things they're doing, looking at their glucose windows. But then it turns out from what I'm hearing is all these health gurus are using the app. They're, they're not can't, they don't have cancer. They just want to know how healthy they can become using this app. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I think that's the first thing I'm doing after we get off this conversation is downloading that thing for myself. Uh, and I, I'm glad you brought that up in terms of, uh, you know, did, things affecting people differently because yeah. you know th there is when you're researching especially on the alternative side of things you you hear you hear a lot about you know cancer feeds on sugar and, and stay away from sugar and so on and so forth but then you also hear a lot about um you know getting in plenty of fruits and some people are you know supposedly curing themselves with you know carrot juice and and other things yeah. um so I, I suppose would that be the answer to that question? Is it's it's more of how it's going to affect you individually than yes, you can eat a, a banana or no, you can't. Well, bananas are not good. I, I they have a very high glycemic index. But if you have grapefruit, 
uh, very grapefruit is a very low glycemic index fruit. So you'll get massive uh, vitamin C from a grapefruit and very little sugar. Um, and you can put stevia on it, which is a, a non-carbohydrate sugar. It's a, a natural kind of a product. So there's a lot of ways um, that you can, uh, yeah, if eating fruits, if you're going to eat an apple or something like that, you have to be very careful because apples, the apples we have today are loaded with sugar, uh, of fructose and all these other things. Oh, yeah, so they've been hybridized have, to taste a little better than the yeah. apples of old. Yes, apples of old were quite bitter, small things. Now they got these things the size of a grapefruit. You know, um, uh, so it, it, everything is full of sugar. So you really, you really have to be knowing how to deal with the with the with the foods that you have. You know, sprouts and things like this. That Hippocrates Health Institute down in, in Florida, there, they've had some great success with cancer patients. But you know, they're chewing on sprouts all day long. You know, uh, um, it, it, you know, you, you, you just you get a lot of exercise in your jaw muscles. You don't get a lot of, uh, you know, so. But but they're managing cancer because they're they're lowering blood sugars and elevating uh, some of the ketones and they're creating a very um, healthy environment that's putting stress on the tumor cells. So it's not just ketogenic diets that can do it. But you really have to understand that these cells what they're eating they're eating glucose and glutamine and eventually you just take that away and they it, regardless of what strategy you're using and you will get you, oftentimes you'll get rather rather. Uh, good success. And cancers can be um, go under complete what they call spontaneous remission. Uh, you want to, the spontaneous remissions are rare, but, but uh, if you go on the right metabolic strategy, they become less rare. Okay. They're not yeah. as, they're not, <laughs> as, not as surprising as you would think, you know, but hard to go, hard to do that when you're being exposed to toxic chemicals and radiation. You know, you got fatigue, you got inflammation, you got all kinds of things that are a, a, an antithesis to the metabolic therapy. Well, not to yeah, not to mention they're carcinogenic themselves. It probably oh, doesn't help. And that fatigue, you get fatigue from this stuff, and that leads to systemic inflammation, which is provocative to the growth of the tumor. And as I told you, they give you steroids to increase your appetite, which is which is insane. Yeah, you would never do that. Yet they do all this stuff. And uh, so this is why we have no major change and why the, the, the death rate continues to increase. Yeah, well, I, you know, just going back to it, I mean, I, I like it that this concept is it's it's empowering to people because it takes the guesswork out of it and it gives them a tool to, you know, actually monitor what these foods or whatever they're taking in or not taking in or are doing to themselves in a in a, you know, in a framework that's that's going to actually going to help. Yes. Um, and kind of on that note, I wanted to go back to to one thing you mentioned earlier on, on the uh, on the antioxidant front, the the tumors, the tumor cell having the, a very robust antioxidant system, and and that's what protects them from a lot of the the chemo's and the radiations and so forth. What what are your thoughts on that in terms of uh, you know like dietary antioxidants or or even something that's going to to boost antioxidant capacity such as uh you know a, a sulforaphane from broccoli spouts um you know boosting up uh the glutathione and superoxide dismutase those sort of things is that is that going to help the cancer cell in your view or is that something that that would only be helpful to a, a healthy cell that's able to, to take it in properly yeah I, I think i think that is going to be more for the healthy cells i don't think the cancer cells are going to generate they're, 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 the antioxidant power is coming primarily from glucose and glutamine. So um, uh, that's where their antioxidant power is coming from. Whereas broccoli sprouts and these other kinds of things, they're going to they're gonna help, the, help the antioxidant capacity of the normal cells. So I'm not really thinking that, I know some people say, oh, you know, if you do antioxidants before you have cancer, if, if you take a lot of antioxidants, it'll, it'll prevent damage to the cells and protect their mitochondria so they don't get cancer. But if you have cancer and you're taking broccoli sprouts or these kinds of things, and the and the antioxidant potential of those foods is going to be, in my mind, in my my view, more helpful to the normal cells than it will be to the cancer cells, because we know exactly what the cancer cells are using to protect themselves, and that's glucose and glutamine, because you've got to realize that pentose. And I don't want to go into too much biochemistry here for your listeners, but the pentose phosphate pathway, which is derived from glucose, builds glutathione. Uh, hugely. And the glutamate from glutamine builds glutathione. And these are the, this is a powerful antioxidant system that's inside the cancer cells. 
So, so their, their power of antioxidant is coming from glucose and glutamine, not from broccoli sprouts. So, uh, um, you know, and these kinds of things. So you got to shut that down. You got to shut down that, that antioxidant capacity, uh, of these tumor cells. And that once they're, once their shield comes off, they become extremely vulnerable, uh, to, to these very simple, uh, uh killing machines, killing uh, treatments. Well, that's what I was going to ask. We're, we're coming up on time, and I want to be respectful of your time. Um, but it, 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 you, you basically have your, your press pulse theory where you're, uh, you know, the, the constant press is the, the, the taking away the fuel, and then the pulse are these targeted, you know, say a, say a hyperbaric oxygen or something like that. Are any of the, you know, cl- clinicians that you're working with that are, that are following this, this principle, have, have you seen any other pulses in particular that 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 you like that that are showing some good results well i mean right now if you use 2-deoxyglucose or some glutamine glu- glucose inhibitors together with the ketogenic diet you know that's all i, I want to also emphasize uh in the press pulse concept we place tremendous em- emphasis on stress psychological stress management for the cancer patient and this has cannot be uh overstated so many cancer patients are, are have anxiety and because of the nature of their disease and and this anxiety uh, elevates blood sugar glucocorticoids which are actually feeding the tumor cells counterproductive to the management of the disease so as part of the press we we use mild exercise we use yoga therapy music therapy you've got to get the cancer patient into a into a more um a homeostatic state reduce anxiety so that these other pulses uh, are so much more powerful and effective in, in the way they manage the disease. So you, you're actually dealing with a whole body physiology uh, when you use press pulse concept. You have certain drugs that will be targeting killing cells where you have other, other aspects that will be improving the overall health and well-being of the cancer patient while they're going through this. It's a staged process. You have to know how, and this is where the, the cutting edge of the strategy is right now. It's dosage, timing, and scheduling. When do, you in, when do you introduce this pulse with that press? You know, what is the dosage? How long should we do this for? And this is, these, these things are easily addressed with, with uh, trial and error kinds of situations, and they will eventually be, be um, uh, honed into a very effective overall therapy for the cancer patient. So you degrade gradually over time the tumor while you, while you enhance the health and vitality of the rest of the body. And this is the whole concept, and this will work. It will work, and it will, will reduce cancer by 50% if we did this. The drop in death would be amazing, and the quality of life for these people would be increased dramatically. It, it, it's just that nobody knows about it, and, and uh, they're not familiar with it. But once you become knowledgeable and familiar, this is going to happen. And the physicians, are they do it half-assed. They do one thing, but they don't do the other thing. And uh, they try to they try to match a very toxic drug in with a ketogenic diet. It's like, oh, what are you doing that for? Well, I have to do it. I got no choice. So, um, so we have to recognize, uh, you know, what we're doing and and how to do it. And once the AMA comes to realize this, then I think we, we're on the roll. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna have cancer managed very very effectively. Uh, but it's just a matter of time. Well, it sure would be nice to see uh, to see a lot of these. Um... You know these these theories and and hypotheses put into you know some clinical trials with some some money behind it. Well, I don't know that you know. I, I just think people want to. The bottom line is people want to live. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not it's not a hard decision, right? If they had the choices, believe me, they would take the alternative ma- route. Uh, but they're not told. They're not even told. Uh, and then and what's more, the poor guy who, who's treating them doesn't even know about it. So, so it's a, it's, 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 we need a massive educational mission here. It's a, it's a massive educational mission. All right, professor, we'll, uh, we'll wrap this up. Oh, one, before we go, and I didn't warn you this was coming, so I apologize, but I do end every interview with asking if you had to boil everything you know about how to stay healthy and disease free into three golden rules, what would those rules be? I would say um, eat less food, (laughs) (laughs) exercise more, and um, uh, reduce anxiety. Um, 
which is melt, mental stress. So you take a diet, a lifestyle issue. Uh, now, the golden rule is very hard to follow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everybody, everybody has their it's, it's our society is so stressed out today. We, we've got people sitting in cars, commuting, you know, uh, eating a donut while they're driving. You know, it's like our our, our system is just so uh, um, so makes it so difficult to follow these golden rules because of the situations we're in today for our jobs and our occupations and kids running around here and doing this. You're trying to balance a hundred different things at the same time. And now you're telling me I got to stop eating and, and I got to do this and that, you know, get it, get a, get a life for you. So, um, but th that's the whole thing. Therapeutic fasting periodically, you know, uh, exercise moderately and uh, try to try to try to do things that are going to reduce um, mental stress, and and I think those are the three things that would probably go far in keeping people in a in a healthier state than they are in today. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that. I think that hits the nail on the head, and you do have to be really intentional about it, and uh, and really. Uh, you know, put a lot of thought into it because it's, it's not going to happen if, if you're not, if you're not yeah. trying to accomplish these things. But, uh, you know, like you said, once, once you realize the benefit and, and how this is all working to help you, it, it becomes a little easier to, to make it all work, at, at least in my experience. Yeah. And, and it's just so hard for so many people. I mean, you have, what kind of schedule do you have? I mean, you know, you know how it is and, and, and we're at risk for all kinds of diseases, not just cancer. Type two diabetes, you know, you get Alzheimer's disease, cardiovascular disease, all these digestive issues. I mean, all of this is related to the same thing. It's just inflammation, body inflammation is the result of deviating away from the environment that we evolved in. And uh, we're paying the, the price, technology, uh, you know, all this kind of stuff. We pay the price and the price is these problems, cancer and all these different diseases. So, uh, but you got to deal with it you just, you just got to know what to do. And if you know what to do, maybe that'll give you a little bit of an advantage. Anyway, those are my, two, my two cents worth. They're good. Good two cents. Good two cents. All right. Uh, that sounds like a good place to, to, to wrap it up for today. Professor Safe to really appreciate you coming on the show. Have a, uh, have a good one. Yep. Thanks. All right. That man is without a doubt the most passionate scientist I have ever encountered if that was your first introduction to the metabolic theory of cancer, I hope you got the basic concept down. We do have episodes with Travis Christofferson, author of Tripping Over the Truth, and Dr. Nasha Winters, author of The Metabolic Approach to Cancer, coming up as well to really drive this home for you. With all that being said, the only post-show note I want to make here is that even though I consider this concept absolutely crucial in the understanding all sides of how to approach cancer, it still is a side. Even if the epigenetic stuff isn't the primary upstream driving factor, it still needs to be addressed. You still need to detox and get rid of the microbes and change your lifestyle. You still need to quell inflammation and ramp up the immune system and so on. To underline this notion even further, I would encourage you to check out a quick interview I did with Dr. Paul Anderson where he made the point that cancer is a polyfactorial disease. I liked that term so much, that's what I made the address of the article, so you can find that at mykidcurescancer.com slash cancer dash polyfactorial slash disease dash disease, excuse me, but an easier way if the spelling of polyfactorial disease doesn't roll right off your fingertips onto the keys might just be to get onto the site and search Paul Anderson. I really hope you got some great information out of this interview with Dr. Thomas Safereed. If you did, be sure to share it out with all of your friends so they can get the same healing info at mykidcurescancer.com slash Thomas dash Safereed. And again, Safereed is spelled S-E-Y-F-R-I-E-D. That's also where you can get the show notes for this episode and all links to any resources that were brought up during the interview. Again, one more time, Ashley and Becky, thank you so much for supporting our work and using your money to make a difference, to help yourselves and to help others by helping us to keep bringing you more and better content all the time. If any other of our awesome listeners want to join in the fun and buy us a figurative cup of organic shade grown coffee per month, you can do so at mykidcurescancer.com slash crowdsponsor. And crowdsponsor is all one word. 
Lord willing, we will see you next week with Jenny Herbachik, author of Cancer Free, Are You Sure? Where we'll, we'll be talking about all ways you can test for cancer, either for early detection or ongoing monitoring that you certainly will not be hearing about in the hospital. Music was provided by the Fat Rat and Tasty Network, and all editing was done by my amazing and gorgeous wife, Teddy, who none of this would be possible without. Thank you so much for hanging out. If you're going through cancer right now, all I can say aside from everything I have already said is keep going. That is all for today. I am Ryan Sternagel signing out. God bless and Godspeed. Godspeed.